this meeting of the superintendent of um, we do have a, a guest here tonight, Glenn Kucher from MASC, and unless there is any objection from the this committee, I would like to just move to um, item three on the agenda, and Glenn had shared some documents with us that were shared in advance to the subcommittee, and we're going to leverage his expertise to help us understand um, the evaluation matrix, the rubric, and how to interpret um, scoring of that both individually and as we um, at, do our duties as the evaluation subcommittee and compiling um, from other members of the committee as well. So, Glenn, I don't know if you need me to present or if you can take over the presentation of any well, of the material. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you see me? Do we have the capacity to uh, to uh, share a screen? You do. You should have the ability to present with the um, toolbar within within. If you don't, I can I can share for you, and you can guide me through what you want me to. Well, I'm, I'm okay. First of all, uh, I, I want you to generally stop me if I'm saying something that you've already heard. But what I'd like you to do, and I can't see myself on the screen, so I'm assuming you can see this document which I sent to you. Uh, is everybody able to pull this document up? It's a sort of walkthrough, and then I also provided you with a uh, what we refer to respectfully as the idiot's guide, uh, only because the state issued about 800 pages of directions and regulations regarding evaluations of educators, and we tried to sort of narrow it down to about 12 pages with some attachments. So uh, I guess I want to uh, start with a couple of things. To go through your superintendent search process, uh, your superintendent evaluation process, there are some things that need to happen at the very beginning. Number one, you need to set district goals, and you need to have uh, goals set for the superintendent. And the superintendent will have specific goals for himself. The school committee will have specific goals for the district. And uh, those all need to be set at the beginning of the search process. Do you have a cycle for your search process? In other words, search. You, I'm sorry, for your evaluation process. Do you have a cycle? Do you go from July to June? Do you go from April to March? How do you do it? So Glenn, this is Mike. I, Matt, if you don't mind, I, I'll be happy to jump in. So we do have a cycle. Um, we typically some set, set goals in the beginning, uh, roughly the beginning of the school year. And we do the evaluation um, before this committee um, is reorganized. So we, we try to complete it by the beginning of May. And in this case, we did um, set goals for the superintendent based on goals that he's provided to us. Okay. So the superintendent has, um, do those goals include the superintendent's personal goals, the superintendent's professional practice goals, and district improvement goals? Those are all, in, those are all before you? Okay. I see Matt shaking his head, yes. Okay, and they were determined. Some of this stuff, Matt, I'm going to ask you to make sure you're keeping me straight on Matt and, and Linda because you guys were on the committee when this is, when this stuff happened, right? So I'm going to assume that these goals were set when in uh, last July or in September. They're typically, yeah, they they're typically set in September timeframe. I think with this year with the delayed start, they were set in October and. They're typically worked on as within this evaluation 
committee and then presented to the full school committee to to um, okay. accept them or or make modifications to them. Well, let me just ask you this about the goals that you set. Were you were they not dramatically compromised by the ongoing pandemic, or were they designed to align with your plans for the pandemic? So I think the best person to answer that would be Linda. I was not on this subcommittee when the goals were, when they were um, approved in the process for okay. that. Well, the reason, the reason, for that. The, the reason that I ask is that most of the superintendent and district goals across the state were based on a set of assumptions that were totally disrupted by the pandemic. So that said, if you had certain student achievement goals and your students were learning remotely, uh, maybe it wasn't as effective, maybe you had uh, illnesses, maybe there were things that the pandemic disrupted, it's hard to hold a superintendent accountable for the goals that you set when the playing field not only wasn't level, but it was a muddy field and a cloudy day. So. Uh, I'm just pointing that out to you. But let's assume that uh, if I may, maybe theoretically, can we, can we step Linda, do you want to go ahead and, oh, yeah, and answer yeah. that? So, so the, uh, they were said in October. <laughs> yeah, because we said it in October. We had a decent idea of what we were working with, I think. So the goals were um, set kind of knowing that it was going to be an unusual year with a lot of differences. And so... Um, the goals were kind of looked at as a way of, with all the cards up in the air, how may we be able to be putting them down and how can we look at the districts and how, you know, to, to be looking at it in that kind of year of flux. So one of the most important things about goal setting is that you have a conversation. The superintendent has the same conversation with principals. Principals have the same conversation with teachers. We say, here are the goals but are there any extraordinary circumstances that you need to be mindful of to put in perspective when we do the evaluation? For example, sometimes a, a principal will say to a teacher, I'm giving you the toughest kids because you're the most experienced and I just want you to know that if you don't do as well as the other teacher who has the easiest kids, we're going to understand this because I'm asking you to take the toughest kids. So similarly, did, did anyone have a conversation with the superintendent that it uh, indicated, remember, we're in a pandemic and at the end of the year, we'll put everything in perspective based on how the pandemic did or did not pan out and based on any other extraordinary circumstances we might have. I don't know whether you did or whether you didn't, but, uh, it would have been an important thing to do. Whether you're going to need to do that next year is unclear. Because with regard to the pandemic, if there's one thing that we've learned, and I'd say this is a universal law of everything, those in the know don't really know. If they did, we'd all be making money on the stock market but this pandemic has proved to be anything but unpredictable. So you have your goals. Theoretically, you've got your sort of qualifications. Who is the aggregator? Have you identified a point person to be the aggregator for collecting information from the, uh, from the superintendent and from the school committee members? Yes, what we typically do, Glenn, as a subcommittee is um, there are four main areas of the goal. So each member of this subcommittee would take one of the, one of each of the areas, aggregate that, and then the overall aggregator in the composite evaluation is done by the chair of the full school committee, who is okay. Mike Dennett. Okay, so uh, that's good. And have you done this before? We have. Okay. So then it should be no surprise that you're coming up to that point in a few weeks where you'll be asking the school committee members to give you feedback on 
the the standards that you've elected to evaluate the superintendent. Correct. And, and I, yep. I think one of the one of the areas that we've struggled with or is lack of consistency across um, the committee and as people aggregate in terms of okay, if we're measuring based upon these standards and you have one rating here, one rating there. How do you compile that together? Do you take an average? Do you, what's the best mechanism to do that and to do it consistently? And I think that's one area that, you know, one of the following pieces I think of is you'll be probably doing the same type of conversation with our full school committee and being able to establish that will, I think, just help with consistency across the board. Well, you have discretion amongst yourselves about any instructions you give the aggregators. So, you know, there are four different levels of uh, rating. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, unsatisfactory needs improvement, proficient, and exemplary. Correct. Uh, there are boards who give a numerical rating to each criteria, mm -hmm. each criterion. Uh, then you add them up and figure out what the average is. And then that is a guide to whoever is developing the recommendation for the school committee. Some of our boards actually have a special rule that says we'll aggregate all of the grades, but we'll throw out the highest and the lowest. In other words, the extreme on the high end and the extreme on the low end, we take those out, we use the ones in the middle. This is very useful in a small board where you might have seven people on the school committee. I mean, an example, I, I'm not gonna name a community, but we did have a community where one of the school committee members really thought Satan brought the superintendent to the district. And nothing the superintendent did was anything but unsatisfactory. So the board established a specific rule that said any extreme comments on the plus or the minus side would be temporarily discarded and we'd use the, the five scores in the middle to develop the average. You might not need to do that with 22. Is it 22 members? 22. In the last, last couple of years, we've had... Uh, I think last year, 21 out of 22 complete the evaluation and the year before that, all 22. So we've, the last few years, we've had a very high um, completion percentage. Okay. But just let me tell you this about the process, because we were among those involved in it. We fought very hard to allow the superintendents and the principals to use their professional judgment in delivering a final grade for their subordinates. In the same way, we fought to let school committee members use their professional judgment before delivering a final grade on a superintendent. So let's just say, for example, on the, uh, on the general category of uh, management and operations, uh, let's say that you uh, get scores all over the place and that uh, the superintendent ranks somewhere in the uh, proficient area. But there are members who argue persuasively that the superintendent's skill here was exemplary despite the fact that the scoring on the other end doesn't reflect that, and here's why. If you can convince the school committee to use their professional judgment and vary from the pure numerical scores and work something out, you can do that. You have the discretion to do that. Now, as I say, it's hard to do on a 22-member uh, board. So, uh, that's that's some of the way that's done ultimately when the final evaluation is written i'm going to assume that the aggr the I, i'm sorry to use the word but the master aggregator will get feedback from the different 
uh, the, the, the different uh, goal aggregators. And then the master aggregator will come up with a recommended aggregated score for the superintendent. And let's that say, uh, uh, you know, let's say we're talking theoretically about a relatively new superintendent. That the new superintendent would uh, would be very lucky to be uh, proficient in a first year. Uh, but let's say that we're talking uh, the same superintendent three or four years down the road, and uh, the numbers don't reflect exemplary performance, but the live assessment of the performance is exemplary. Or conversely, the live assessment is that superintendent's overrated and, and the superintendent is not proficient. The wisdom of the group can outweigh any numerical data that you may use for the purpose of advising you. And that's why uh, when the, the, the real challenge comes, not so much when members of the school committee rank the superintendent on uh, professional goals or performance in general, but what the collective body feels is the is the really effective score to use. So that that's really the, the, the quick summary. The 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 difficult part of the process, one of the difficult parts of the process is deciding which criteria, which of the criteria you will use to evaluate the superintendent uh, during the course or over the course of the year. And if you could go to the uh, to the guidebook, and uh, if you can share, uh, whoever is doing this on the screen, if you can go to page thirteen, let me just pull that one, and if you yeah, can turn. Show that. <laughs> And sorry, for the um, it's the model rubric. There you go. Go back a little bit. There you go. Can you can you show that? And and can everybody read it? Let me see. Does that help? Yes. When we when we made a booklet out of this thing, we wanted this to be the centerfold, but uh, it didn't quite work that way. Okay. So here you notice that at the beginning of the year you'll come to an agreement with the superintendent about what standards he will be, I say he because your superintendent's a he, he will be uh, evaluated by. And here you see four different categories of standards, instructional leadership, management and operations, family and community engagement, and professional culture. And underneath there, you will see probably 20 different areas. Uh, for example, in instructional leadership, you have curriculum, instruction, assessment, evaluation, and data. So there's five there. And then on standards and management and operation, you have another five different uh, substandards. And then for family and community engagement, there's four. And then for professional culture, there's six. What we strongly recommend is that a couple of people sit down with the superintendent at the beginning of the year and pick out maybe eight or 10 of these different standards. Absolutely, positively, don't do them all. It's an impossible task. It's unreasonable. Only in Massachusetts, under the leadership of the previous commissioner, could anybody envision anything this complicated. So, Glenn, we, we do do that by practice, and it's worked really well in terms Good. of, and we come to agreement on it. But this is where I think the evaluation, when you think about the, we'll call it the, not the master aggregator, the individual aggregator. Or the individual members. They're okay. using, they're just using they were using standard one. 
and we're saying, okay, we're going to focus on curriculum and instruction. And there are three kind of, there are three sub subcategories underneath that. How do you then, if there are two of them, A and B, that you're doing, how do you then determine if somebody is proficient, where are they rank in the rate in the overall instructional leadership based upon the ratings of the two below that? If one falls drastically short and the other is proficient and the average is here, do you rate? And I think those are the types of things that can vary here in the number underneath the four right and that's where that's where the bubble up comes up and then it's kind of all four become equally weighted in terms of the the main rubric what we, what we suggest is that first of all somebody sits with the superintendent and comes up with 10 or 12 different things you're suggesting the first two curriculum and instruction so i'm just saying this example yeah. just for the Example okay. saying that two in the under the first standard, there are three under the second standard, there are two under the third one, and three under the fourth one. The whole yeah. aggregate, right? By nature, they're weighted differently because there's more under one versus the other. Well, that would be up to you and the superintendent to decide the appropriate weighting because mm -hmm. I mean, a, a lot of districts uh, rate instructional leadership much higher than the others. Uh, those that are having management or budget problems might rate too higher. Uh, mm -hmm. If there's a really bad relationship with the community, there might be a, item three might get a higher rating. Uh, and if, uh, uh, you know, there are issues in the superintendent's office or, or among the, uh, the management, you might see something under four. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's an individual call. Yeah. But Matt, may I uh, jump in for a moment? Michael, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think that there's two separable questions in this process that we're trying to, to, to get at. One is the question for, and it's kind of an instruction or, or advisory to the individual members who are filling out the rubric. I think there's a separable question to the aggregators about how they aggregate. But perhaps we can start with the instruction to the members and how they fill out the rubric. Okay. If I'm understanding Matt's question correctly, you know, if we have, for example, you know, um, uh, two substandards in instructional leadership, just by way of example, and it's Matt, Matt's example, he mentions curriculum and instruction. Mm -hmm. The first question is, what evidence is needed to indicate the level that should be selected, whether it's proficient or, or, or whatever the ranking is on that substandard. And then the second question, Glenn, is if I, list, if I, if I as a member uh, pick, for example, proficient for one and exemplary for the other, how do I reconcile what I pick for standard one when I roll it up to that standard? Does that you make sense? your professional judgment in doing that, and that's what makes it complicated. But let me point you, let me ask you to do this. If you could uh, go to page 16. If you've got the book in front of you, look at page 16. See, page 16 gives you sample definitions of what success would look like. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of the process, your subcommittee should have a discussion with the superintendent about how to define success in its various iterations. And you are free to steal these descriptors, modify them, or come up with your own. These are just suggestions that give you an idea of, of what success would look like. Uh, well, there, there, there is as well that shows um, sample evidence as well, correct? Okay. Uh, now you say as, as evidence by. So now I want you to yeah. go to page. I'm going to show you right now. Go to page 36. Okay. 
I apologize for the scrolling effect. No, it's okay. All right. 36, right there. You just, well, right there. Keep it right okay. there. Okay. Page 36 is the rating chart for the different areas of uh, superintendent performance. And in your case, you'd be rating the superintendent on 1A and 1B. Now, what do you want to use as evidence? At the beginning of the year, you work out with the superintendent what evidence he will present to you. And some samples of what that evidence might be are listed right on the bottom of the page. Those are just samples. Uh, There's 13 different possible uh, sets of examples there. You might have some of your own. I just want to make a gratuitous editorial comment here. You notice school improvement plans are in red. Uh, school improvement plans are reviewed by the school committee. They are not subject to your approval. They used to be subject to your approval. Without telling us, the superintendents lobbied the Department of Education and the legislature to remove school improvement plan approval from the school committee's purview. So we informed the superintendents that for the rest of my life, we would make sure that school committee members were reminded that they should use school improvement plans as vehicles for determining whether schools are improving. So that's one bit of, that's a little vendetta that we have with the Superintendents Association. So you're gonna see that in bold red everywhere it comes up. However, there are all kinds of different evidences that the superintendent can provide to you. Please do not ask him to give you all 13 or 14 but come up with some, uh, you know, Mr. Superintendent, what do you think would be the best sources of uh, information to document how effectively these goals were being met? Now, the, the reason, and, and I'm not saying this because the superintendent's on the call, but I, but I am saying that, you know, those of you who've ever been subject to self-evaluation understand that you're always harder on yourself than the boss is going to be because you know what your shortcomings are you just hope the boss doesn't find out well it's the same with superintendents they sort of know where they need to to do what they need to do and uh if you sit with them and work this out you'll have a good evaluation tool so the, the, the sort of complicated parts of all of this are uh, to figure out what goals you'll use, what standards you'll use, how you'll do the counting, the aggregating, and how you'll edit them and, and agree on what you want them to be. Uh, and there are no there are very few rules for it there are only best practices so with regard to identifying the goals sit with your superintendent and reconcile the goals of the district with the superintendent's professional practice goals with regard to which uh, of the standards and uh, elements below the standards uh, I would suggest somebody sits with the superintendent and says, which of these do you think are the most appropriate for us to use? Second, how will we know whether you are successful? How will we define that? What should we look for? Okay. Number three, who's going to do the goal by goal aggregation and the master aggregation? And then how will you figure out how to uh, edit the final evaluation so that the superintendent has his evaluation? 
Now, this is particularly challenging because it relies on the collaboration and cooperation of the people in the room. I don't know whether you know this or not, but group editing is a crime against humanity. I won't do it with four people. You have to do it with 22 people. So there's a lot of pressure on the aggregator to try to come up with a really good consensus evaluation. And whoever is the master aggregator, uh, uh, you know, I wish you well. We're often asked to, uh, to sort of lean over the shoulder and, and give you some assistance in doing this, and that's fine. We don't do aggregation for you. That's got to be done in your district. Uh, it, it's not impossible, and it's not extraordinarily difficult, but it does require good judgment. And uh, where it works is where, uh, you know, people can collaborate well. And sometimes there are challenges because nobody wants an A. Nobody wants a B. Everyone wants an A. Every superintendent wants to be exemplary, uh, even though the state says that proficient is a very high standard. Uh, that's like telling everybody B is a good grade. So there's argument back and forth. Uh, I say the one, uh, a few of the, the guidelines that I like are to uh, make sure that the extreme comments, pro and con, are, uh, are sort of balanced against the consensus of the middle. And I like to say, you know, an individual may be biased, but the species is wise. And the collective group wisdom can be very, very effective. And that's really, uh, you know, if, if you wanted to use a numerical scale for the purpose of picking the four categories as a guide, do it, but use it just as a guide. Don't let the, uh, the numbers beat the heart or the gut in, uh, in doing something, especially where there are things that are highly subjective and difficult to rate, like, you know, your communication skills. One person's blunt, rude, uh, you know, blunt and rude person is another person's uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, and to the point uh, individual. So. Can I ask Ooh, a question? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Linda. Um, so this is my first time serving on this subcommittee. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so last year was actually the first time that I had uh, done the evaluation as a member. And so one thing that we seem to run into were that individual members were using the rubric individually so um, when it seemed like some were looking at it as a true rubric that you have to meet X, Y, and Z criteria to get this level rating, and other members would say, well, they got two out of three, so we'll bump it up. And so I have no real sense of what um, is typically done across school committees, if there is no typical, um, how to arrive at that consensus of, of how we'll use the rubric as a as a total body so that there's consistency in um, just that basic use of the tool. And then however the answers come out, the answers come out. But right. that that basic like building block level. You you could uh, come to some agreement at the beginning that X number of examples of success will guarantee you a rating in a higher grade. You could do that. Uh, but it's a lot like, I don't know if you've ever watched a diving competition. You know, a, a diver does a dive, and the judges award something between 0 and 10. And one judge will give you an 8.5, and, and another judge will give you a 6 for the same dive. And it happens so quickly that it's hard to sort of figure out why a grade is a grade. You just have to take the good faith professional judgment of, of the individuals, and that's very hard. 
sort of like judging, uh, you, know, you go to see a movie. How was the movie? How many stars do you give the movie? Quick. You know, it, it's, you could say, well, you know, there were, there were 10 great belly laughs in that movie, so uh, that's my standard. Or it made me cry three times. That's my standard. You know, it, it's, it's hard to say. But you should work it out at the beginning of the year so that you get some guidance. And you might want to talk amongst yourselves. I, I like the idea of using a numerical grade averaged followed by a good discussion about where the consensus thinks someone is. And you can use the, the, uh, the definitions here in the matrix to, uh, to guide you. And you could check off the, uh, for example, on, on, uh, on uh, data, uh, not the data form, on, uh, on curriculum and assessment, uh, on an, an instruction. Does the superintendent empower, for example, for exemplary behavior, of exemplary performance, does the superintendent empower administrators to collaborate individually? Uh, are they adaptable? Are things well structured? Does the superintendent continuously, continuously monitor and assess? Does the superintendent model this practice in what he does and what he expects from others? There's five different criteria within that exemplary category. And if the superintendent meets most of them, then perhaps he's exemplary. On the other hand, if uh, things don't get done, not so much. So Glenn, if I can ask a question, um, and, and, I, and I suspect that this is true, whether you're talking about a teacher evaluation, a principal evaluation, or a superintendent evaluation. Yes. But if we've already picked the criteria, mm -hmm. And the criteria, you know, by, you know, what's a needs or a profession or an exemplary exists, are we not as members looking for evidence of, for example, exemplary practice under cultural proficiency in order to declare that or, or to rate that this, that this uh, uh, area should be marked as exemplary? Yes. Again, as a, as a member, in other words, is it not the the, the 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 member needs to look for evidence from the superintendent to make the appropriate rating? Is that a true Correct. statement? Correct. And you will have let the superintendent know what you'll look be looking for for evidence. Now, as we get towards the end of the year, the superintendent should be preparing to respond to those categories for which he's being held accountable and to respond specifically to that. So you can make a judgment about whether or not you agree with uh, the superintendent's assessment of his own performance based on what he's, uh, what he's indicated has been performed. Now I've been in, I've been in districts myself where, you know, the, the superintendent will be speaking to, uh, whoever, like the Rotary Club or whatever, and talk about how successful they've been in several different areas. And I'm thinking to myself, no, we're not. What is this? A uh, superintendent might consider some level of performance a success, and you might agree or you might disagree. That is your right to use your professional judgment. It makes the process a little less precise and a little more sloppy, but uh, we really wanted to give school committee members the ability to just uh, to rate with the heart and the head and the gut all at the same time without being limited to the calculator. Glenn, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So when you when we were just looking at the area that showed potential evidence could be this could be that and yep. some of those pieces were student feedback um, faculty feedback some of that's unpredictable at the point of when a, a goal might be established and sometimes that feedback might come in through different means through the course of a year 
Is that something that you traditionally see established in terms of this is how we as a school committee might formalize getting that feedback? Or is it more of we're just going to see the feedback that we get through through the community, through the students, through the teachers, whatever that is, and then utilize that as they relate to the individual goals and standards? There, there are two ways to answer that question. First of all, uh, you are within your rights to use your own personal observations and even uh, feedback that you get from members of the community who talk to you. You know, for example, if you send somebody to the superintendent's office with their problem and they call you back and they report, thank you very much, we were able to see the superintendent, we were referred to the right person, uh, we felt the process was good, we're very grateful for the superintendent's collaboration. You know, if you hear that over and over again, that's anecdotal data you can use. If people come to you and say, what did you send me to him for? He was rude told me I wasn't fit to be the mother of these children. Um, and you keep hearing that stuff. Well, that's anecdotal data too that you can use one way or the other. So you, 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 you know, you're observing the superintendent at meetings. You observe what the superintendent writes and sends to you. You have a sense of the superintendent's communication style, uh, personality, interpersonal skills, whatever. Um, you're always evaluating the superintendent on some of those areas as well as the documentation. On the other hand, there are some districts that work out with the superintendent a means of gathering data from the stakeholders. In other words, let's let the, uh, the faculty or the community weigh in. Uh, that's sometimes called a 360 degree evaluation and um, they're hard to do uh, especially uh, because a lot of people want the ability to uh, participate in a 360 degree evaluation anonymously. And there's a real question of fairness about letting people respond anonymously to a superintendent's evaluation or a principal's evaluation for that matter, uh, because you just don't know who they are. Now, the, there was, to, there was uh, a plan to establish a means of gathering feedback from students and parents. And a major effort was announced that that was going to happen. And that is going to go into effect in 2016. So we all know what happened to that idea. Uh, if you want to do a 360 degree evaluation, there are certainly ways to do it. There are ways to survey the community, but you need to do it uh, with the collaboration of the superintendent based on the superintendent's contract and, uh, and in a way that's mutually agreeable, which means quite frankly, that people um, would have to identify themselves. And you know, when we, uh, when we do superintendent searches and we do surveys and we disaggregate the data, uh, it's very interesting that uh, a lot of people evaluate principals through the lens of their own child's experience or teachers in the same way or superintendents in the same way. So uh, it's very hard to adjust something like that for fairness and equity. But it can be done if it's mutually agreeable. So... So Glenn, I have one other question um, sure. about the tool itself. And and again, you know, I think and, and, and so you're you're certainly been helpful in terms of giving us some principles to use to um, that we can espouse uh, for what people approach the, the rubric. Um, you know, people come at it with different, I think, different um, approaches. And one approach um, that we, I think we notice sometimes is that somebody will just, um, because there's no requirement to enter perhaps, um, comments, if one is rated, if one used a proficient rating, they just circle proficient all the way down the line and turn it in. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't know if, if you see that in, in other places, it seems, 
like what we're trying to invite and what's most helpful, whether the rating is, is proficient and truly proficient or otherwise, is subjective um, feedback and observation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess I'm curious why the decision to not require a comment um, when you when somebody's when the proficient rating is used is was was put into place. Well, best best practices would be for everybody to provide some comment, mm -hmm. but uh, that's a lot of comments for people to come up with, and it's hard to tell elected officials you've been elected, but I'm commanding you to do something. So it's a matter of collegiality and persuasion. And by the way, if someone, uh, if you're arguing back and forth on proficient versus exemplary or uh, proficient versus needs improvement, the group may give less weight to something that's not defended than something which is explained. So you might want to explain that to the group. Makes sense. Hey, this is this is Eric. Quick question for for Glenn. The regarding the three hundred and sixty review, how common is that? It sounds like it's not based not on our very practice. common at all. Yeah, and, and in addition to that, you mentioned the that it couldn't remain anonymous. Uh, I just well, wasn't. It could, it could, but in order to be fair, uh, you know, you, uh, otherwise. I mean, let's say, for example, that we were doing a principal's evaluation. And uh, let's say we're doing a superintendent's evaluation and we're in another district, but the superintendent fired my cousin or wouldn't hire my nephew. And I'm really angry with the superintendent uh, uh, because uh, uh, the superintendent wouldn't support giving us a Good Friday holiday. So I'm going to tell all my relatives, log on, give the guy a low rating, bring the scale down. Very easy to do. So I just I want to ask a clarifying question to that. There's a difference between somebody submitting a response anonymously versus it being versus uh, someone's participation being known to perhaps the committee or somebody be participating that's known to the committee but not um, those, ind those individual uh, comments are, are aggregated so that they're not tied to a particular individual. I'm not sure, I think I butchered that, that clarification. In other words, the school committee would protect the identity of the responders. Correct. But use the data. Correct. Uh, I think you could probably do that if you wanted to, but I can tell you that We've discussed this with superintendents, although I've never discussed this with your superintendent. I've discussed it with a lot of superintendents. They don't want to do it unless the people who are offering uh, critiques of their performance can be identified. So let me ask it a, a little bit of a different way. Could, could it or have we seen it viewed as we know it's a controlled environment? So this survey is going out to this population of people, whether they're teachers. This survey is going out to students who are, who are evaluating something to do with something going on at that school. And that allows a committee to perhaps get an aggregation of that controlled environment without saying one person said this or said that. Does that make sense, Glenn? Yeah, there are all kinds of ways to do it. But a district generally needs to uh, develop that in collaboration with the superintendent and make sure that they're okay with it. Have you seen types of examples where it perhaps is something that isn't done once a year, where it's done regularly to establish baseline measure? progress or sentiment or any of that those components when it comes to feedback you mean a 360 yeah no I, I in fact I'd have to go to our listserv and ask people 
if they've done a 360 degree evaluation. The question comes up several times a year and we advise people, but we don't always hear back from them. I guess, I guess, have we seen, and this is a different question than like a superintendent, but have we seen skip level meetings in the educational where a teacher would meet with the superintendent to talk about the principal and their, their leadership at the school? Have we seen those types of things happen in the educational world? Possibly and probably, but I'm not aware of them. I mean, that would, that would make sense. Uh, yeah. I mean, I can tell you that there are lots of instances of school committee members bumping into teachers and others in the supermarket and saying, tell me, uh, tell me what you think of the principal. Those are risky conversations, too. Sure. Yeah, I, I share that just from experience in the professional world. I have skip level meetings regularly with my boss's boss. I have 360 degree evaluations from the people I work with or customers and feedback. So to me, it's, it's always been something that I, I understand the dynamics of education, but I don't understand why it's not welcomed from an opportunity to improve. Because that's when it's collaborated and it's done appropriately, everyone's rowing in the same direction. The, the, you're right. And the theory of all of this is that the evaluation system was designed to help people improve their practice as administrators or as teachers. And right. my entire life has been uh, outside of the public sector, except for a very short period of time and my service on the school committee. And I was subject to 360 degree evaluations uh, in, in my job. But I can tell you that the be, you know, if the biggest lie that you're told to is that people tell you they voted for you, uh, the biggest lie that I think was told to us was that these evaluations are confidential and any comments you put down will never be uh, linked to you. But if there are only 10 of us in the country who do this job, you know, and 90% of us say the boss is a schmuck, they're going to know who to come to. I'm sorry. So will we be we'll be doing this basically over again for the school committee next week? Yeah, I, I think that um, you, you know maybe you and I can talk because there's some things that we covered tonight that um, you know we for example we've already gone through the um, the goal setting and um, so that part of it you know I think the focus really would be on um, you know some of the principles to use when filling out the rubric. Mm -hmm. um, now this meeting next week is 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 it also remote? Yes. Okay. There's no way that meeting would be live. Well, it's so, uh, it's not let in me person. Say this to you. At at the first available opportunity after the meeting next week, if people at any time wanted to go over this again, this is so much easier to communicate to a larger group of people when everybody's in the same room at the same time. Yeah. I, you know, we have no choice. Zoom is what it is because we all need to be safe. Uh, right. But possibly, you know, as you start this process next year or at some point over the summer, it might be safe to have a live conversation about it as well. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. You know, the timing for our next meeting, right after our next meeting, we're going to open the evaluation tool. So it's... Um, it's 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 uh, it's timely, but um, we'll certainly keep in mind and, and appreciate uh, you know being able to um, provide this information easier when it's uh, when we're all together. Okay. Hey, one one um, self-serving question I have is that I've only been on the committee for a matter of weeks, <clears throat> and I'm on the subcommittee to help you know discuss and administer the process, but I don't know if there's standard practice around people who are so new who might not have uh, a lot of information to be able to really evaluate the superintendent there is a there is a common practice where a school committee will say that uh, as a protocol that one needs to have served on the school committee for x number of months in order to participate in the evaluation 
Sometimes it's actually a full year. But if you're new to the committee and you just came on board, uh, it wouldn't be fair to anybody to ask you to evaluate the superintendent unless you were, for example, a very active parent who attended every school committee meeting and, uh, and follows very closely and feels comfortable enough doing this. That is rarely the case. Yeah. Usually they ask people with less than six months of service uh, not to participate uh, or not to participate in a way that would count. Okay, thank you. So, uh, as I say, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I will see, we'll see you all next, uh, whenever it is, it's the, it's the only thing on my schedule. So if, uh, we'll have plenty. <laughs> it's all, it's uh, Monday, Monday, April 12th, Glenn. Thank you. So yeah. I, I don't know if there's any other questions that from, uh, from the group, but if there's not, um, so I appreciate I make sure I have it on the right date, April 12th, seven o'clock, right? Yeah, we may. I may actually have to ask you to, to if we, if it's possible, do it at eight o'clock. But I'll, I'll connect with you separately on that. Oh, you want to back it up to eight o'clock? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, whatever. Uh, let's make sure we have the. Uh, I guess if I had started this conversation on Google Chrome, then Google might have been more user friendly, letting me in. Instead, <laughs> I started on Microsoft. Uh, whatever so it didn't work okay we'll be uh, we'll get better the second time around i appreciate glenn very thank much you. you uh spending time with us tonight thanks for joining thank you very much take care thank you. all right well that was a good productive hour um before we move on from that does anybody want to Share any feedback or any any points from what Glenn had just gone over with us. Uh, can I ask? So, I guess what uh, I took away, and I want to know if if this is also your feeling too, is that it seems like it's up to the committee's discretion to should uh, advise. The full committee on using the tool as a rubric, as a you know, two out of three is a. I mean, that that seems to be up to us versus a consensus across other school committees on how they use the tool. Is that is that a fair takeaway? Because that that was that seems to be the biggest question I had from last year is what <laughs> if we if we're hitting this you know these marks? Okay, so then this this fits into this kind of, um, you know, proficient heading. But then you look at another members once once they're all um, made public and you can see that they were using a different set of standards, of, but not standards, but that's confusing the terminology here, but they were using a different operating system on how to choose proficient or whatever. So can we as a subcommittee discuss how how is it i mean at, at this stage in the game it feels um well i guess that's my question is what how does that feel for the for this group for for you daryl too so oh. my um my my um i'm sorry matt go ahead i, I didn't mean to no on. no my, go ahead i was gonna just respond to um a couple comments, but I'd like to hear your perception, Mike, first. Thanks. So um, I guess my takeaway was, you know, I was I was kind of looking for um, some hard and fast rules because to me that's, you know, part of what we struggle with is how do we manage 22, doing anything across a committee of 22, right? So I was trying to look for some standard and, and the standard was, well, use your professional judgment. <laughs> <laughs> so um right so so and i get that um and and so you know I, to me i think the i i think that we want to you know some of the takeaways that i that pulled out of this was um to to look for evidence to go back to that um 
rubric definition that talked about, you know, if, and, 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 and I, I believe we highlight the, the criteria that we picked. Um, but, you know, going back and look at that criteria and look at um, those um, areas that indicate whether it's, you know, proficient or exemplary or other. So you focus on, I guess, we, the best thing we can do is give some, some guidance that's less concrete, but, but it's, you know, look for evidence, use that, um, that part of the rubric. Um, it's, um, uh, you know, again, go going, going back to uh, using professional judgment. I, I think the other thing to me that is, is a big deal is to ask people as much as possible to provide comments almost to ignore the instruction or not have an instruction that says proficient means you don't need to provide a comment, but everything else provide a comment. Def you know, pick your rating and tell us why. And I think it's reasonable for us to say that as aggregators, um, when we look at these things and we're trying to balance, um, you know, the people who have given an explanation for why they've picked what they've picked is going to weigh more heavily than those that don't. And that we could take that under advice when we go through the aggregation process. That was my processing of, of the comments as I was hearing it. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to hear from Dr. McCall, but my my processing was similar to to yours, Mike, in the sense that I think use your professional judgment. He also used the term swampy. So knowing that that can be all over all over the spectrum, so to speak. But I think one thing that we benefit from in this case is with 22 members, we might be able to use aggregate data to just kind of get a feel for it. But again, he said, don't look at just data, take a look at those details behind that data. So to Mike's point, I think if members are encouraged to put their rationale behind what their rating is, those are things that the aggregators can use their discretion to be able to then compile those. I think one of the things we have the benefit of as a subcommittee is breaking out the aggregators to do the work independently, but then coming together as a subcommittee to talk about it as well. So that gives another kind of set of eyes on that to make sure we're comfortable before bringing to the 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 full school committee so that was kind of my thought process on process on it in an ideal world i would love it to just be a b and c and you're here here and here and you hit a button and it tells you what 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 the total is and here is where it is but we're talking very complex um it's a complex decision, so there's a lot that goes into it. Dr. McCall, Eric, I don't know if you had anything to, to add as well. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, you know, I also agree. I, I think one of the things we need to do as a district is just do this a lot earlier. Um, it's just October. I mean, I just looked. This, we didn't approve it until November 3rd. So it's just, I'm looking at the time frame for this, and it's just so little time while all this other stuff is going on in, in the world right now and in, in in our world in terms of school. But going back to what Mike said earlier, I think the evident piece, if we can define, you know, so let's just say we get together in the summer, we have our, um, you know, we have our group that's back together after we reorganize and we look at goals, we look at specific evidence associated with those goals. That will be so helpful in terms of how I kind of work through the year, as well as the building principles, as well as teachers, because there's kind of a trickle down effect with all of this. That ultimately will play out, I think, much better in terms of how we, you know, we kind of do this. And I think ultimately it'll help members be able to say, oh, okay, I can see. Uh, okay, we're in curriculum, okay, 1B or 1A, uh, curriculum and instruction. So it looks like Daryl, here's the evidence that he gave A, B, C, D, that goes along with this. Yeah, I can see that following into, you know, following into, you know, proficient or needs approval, one of these two. That to me would make it a little easier for people. And it would also help me, it would help the building principles. I think it would just tie everything together uh, a little better. But the earlier 
the better because again, it's just, it's time. It, that's really the reality. Yeah, just, I, I would totally agree with that. It's, it's, I don't know what happened early on as far as not just timing, but the nature of those discussions and, and the involvement of all parties and how that works. I really think, I feel strongly that, you know, unless Dr. McCall is really on board with, with what we're doing, it's hard to really make this as valuable as it needs to be. And so that might have happened. I'm not saying it didn't. I just say, just emphasizing the point around that type of collaboration early on, of course, timing too. To the, to the point about the ratings, you know, um, it's it's hard for me you know like in my job for example we see something called csat right it's a customer satisfaction score it's basically based on one question that's not very valuable and people give it a number and it means re really very little to the quality of what we're doing but it's something that you could use more as a marketing tool i'd say and that's i don't think that's what we're trying to get at here so if, if we can find a way to encourage um, members of the committee to really be thoughtful and guide them in providing more evidence behind what they're giving us, that's going to be way more effective. Now, I don't know if you can require that. It's hard for me to imagine like I could put a nine or whatever scale we're using and just leave it like that. It's just not who I am. And so it's just not enough to be valuable. And so... I feel like you almost want to just not even consider those, but that's not fair either because, right. you know, that's just not fair to rule out people. But I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way for us to strongly encourage the value of adding more substantial information and what that could mean for us in the long term as a, as a group and an administration and district. Yeah. I, I, I think, um, you know, part of what we're hearing, and I think we even heard it in a lot of Glenn's responses to our questions, right? Um, there's a, there's a blending of art and science here. And I think that, you know, there was some desire to bring a little more science to the process, um, a little more science than art. And, you know, I, I think that, um, in, again, and part of his responses is kind of like, well, it can't be all science, right? So, so I think that there are some principles that we've talked about. Um, the one that you're mentioning, Eric, which is, you know, I think an important one, one I agree with is, you know, let's let's you know ask for, um, you know, really emphasize um, comments and commentary and and you know why are you picking what you're picking, um, and I think the more information that we have makes this process better. We're not going to be perfect. We're not try, We're not going to have. We don't have the answer on how to do this scientifically. I don't think it's ever going to be scientific. Is what I'm realizing. Um, but I think we're going to be better. And I think any, you know, like at any time that we're able to be as concrete as we can early on about what our expectations are. And that's the other part of this too. I mean, we, we are in the process where we are and that is, you know, we're about to go through the evaluation process. When we go into goal setting, um, you know, the process for setting expectations, uh, I agree. We should do it early. We should be clear. We should have smart goals. We should define what success looks like. Um, and, and, and um, you know, so I think that we have um, some understanding for how we can continue to get better. But I think even having this discussion is going to make this process better than it was last year. You know, just one other thing I'd just add to that is that, you know, a lot of people don't, um, understand or see value and then don't do things, right? So I feel like if the committee members are explained, like there's a lot of value for you as a committee member and what you represent on this committee in doing and providing this information, because it's not, it's, it's more helpful in the long run to the entire organization, right? Mm -hmm. And so like people feel like, okay, it's going to mean something. It's not just a number that I need to get through and do by a certain date. This is going to be valuable and and um, embraced when it's provided. Just another thought. I think that I would just want to add that you know we are all um, we all signed up for this, right? <laughs> we all all twenty two of us signed up to do this position. Um, 
you know, I think that there's this perception that perhaps um, not all the committee members are uh, concerned or something. And and I, I mean, that's, I, I think that's nonsense. Um, we, we can't put, and I'm not saying that's what is happening here. I'm just saying there, you know, we are volunteers of our time um, and we all came to this to give back to our community for our, our students. And so I think that um, rather than castigating people who don't give feedback, maybe we need to understand why they're not. And so um, I don't know if there are perpetual, you know, you can kind of guess where there aren't going to be co comments or something like that. And just find, I think it's an opportunity for collaboration versus trying to like, people into giving comments. Maybe that's the wrong way to put it, but. Um. Yeah, I, I guess, Linda, I, I, um, I, I um, and I don't know if it's, you're responding to something that I said, I think that you are. Um, and and I by no means are number one, or look, was I'm looking to castigate people for not providing comments. If anything, I think I'm trying to encourage um, people to give us more subjective information about why they're picking what they're picking. Um, and, and if that's coming across as something different, I, that's not my intention. Um, I'm certainly not interested in in tricking um, anybody. Um, you know, I I I, I'm, I, I, uh, I realize that I'm probably talking too much, uh, <laughs> and um, I, but uh, I, I'm I'm I, I want to be clear that my goal and objective is that we have as much um, consistency in instruction, even if those instructions are not precise and scientific. And when they're not precise and scientific, it's, it's subjective. And so the more subjective information people can give us, I think the better job that we can do as a subcommittee to, to aggregate and provide a, a composite evaluation. Well, one of the, one of the, challenges we face um, just is in that in the evaluation form it specifically says in black and white if you choose proficient you comments are not required if you choose exemplary comments are required so I think that that can sometimes give the person completing it okay I'm done with this section I rated proficient and I have all all of this in my in my mind as I'm going through the rubric and I'm going to move to the next next now to me it's incredibly risky to say I'm going to dismiss that rating because they did not add any detail to that so the question is how do we encourage that proficient rating to at least be supported with this is why I read the I read this piece on the rubric and it fell into here because of A, B, and C, right? And I think that's where we want to get to with any rating because the best way for Dr. McCall, who's the person being evaluated, to be able to improve, to be able to um, realize the things that he's done really well and continue to do those is to get that feedback. If someone just says, you're proficient, that's not really meaningful feedback to be able to improve. So I don't know how we get there, Linda, but I think that we need to stress the importance of that because in any situation, that feedback should go into the goals for next year or call to action on any of those items. That's how I look at it. So can I make a suggestion then for when we go, when we um, have a full meeting is to, um, stress the use of the evaluation for professional practice, for um, professional development and, and future, um, you know, future work that uh, rather than, I think that um, in the past, it's per, it, it can come off as a uh, just, just, just rank it, turn it in, be done. And that, and to really stress that this is part of an ongoing practice, that there is this cycle that we've got this, the results from this are going to inform next year. And 
really stress that part of it so that um, you know that it, there's that encouragement of don't just you know leave your Yelp review, but you know because that's where it just I think it gets into that gray area. And um, and honestly, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but the the rubric issue really I think I'm just I'm just thinking of whenever you have a group of people trying to work off of one system, you've got to make sure that, that they're using the system in the same way, even if their professional opinion lay, lays a different set of answers, at least to have that guiding um, principle understood. It, I think that, that's been a really big problem when I've looked back, looked back at past evaluations, and I don't see how you can get any good information if if there's right. many two different directions. So, so I think, think, uh, what's your suggestion? I mean, do you, do you do you have a suggestion for something we ought to consider about doing differently or in, different instructions? I think honestly, it's just it's it's just that are we using it as a rubric that you have to hit all of these aspects in order for it to be labeled proficient, or do you need to have you know, a majority. Do you round up? Do you round down? That That is the question that came. And I think that it, it sounds from, from Glenn Kucher that there isn't a one way to do it, but I think that we need to get our 22 people to do that one. And, it, and obviously it needs to be in concert with Dr. McCall. And if I can just jump in real quick, Linda, I think what you said goes along with um, what I did with building principal and, and administrators uh, two years ago, which was really looking at um, the teacher's rubric and calibrating. So by doing those calibrations, we're getting somewhat of a similar evaluation process that happens in at Houghton versus Glenwood. Uh, and again, I think what happens, it, it's tough with a school committee, uh, as Glenn said, and you said of you know people who are volunteering their time and they're not all educators and so forth, but if there's a way to help with calibration moving forward. So I think it's looking at this a little earlier on, looking at how this kind of ties back together. That might be something that helps ultimately with that discussion and their capacity to fill this out. Yeah, I think for sure for next year, I guess what I keep on coming up against is we've got next week, <laughs> and we, I mean, and it's not like we can skip a year. It's not like we can, you know what I mean? So that's where I just, I think that it sounded like we just need to make a decision for, for this year. And maybe I'm, I'm just looking for something that's, for, that's black and white that can't be. Um, but I feel like as a body, we should be, we should be in agreement in the instructions given out and the guidance that we're giving the full committee who, like you say, are not all educators. Um, you know, and I mean, I know you, you, we've talked about a lot about, um, you know, for-profit companies and, you know, public sector and that kind of thing. And, you know, coming out of nonprofits, it's, um, it, in that way, I think it is a little bit more like education where there isn't that focus on, um, uh, on output in the same way. You think about it a little bit differently than just. Um, profit. I mean, obviously, right? It's in the name, nonprofit. So, um, it, the calculation on how you determine um, uh, proficiency and whatnot is a little bit different. Different. It's a different consideration. So, so what I'm looking at really is just we're on a deadline. We've got we we've got this outstanding question of how we want to go forward, and if this isn't the the time or place, then so be it. But in my head, it is. <laughs> so I, I think a lot of one of the points you had raised, Linda, was similar to what Eric was talking about, about the impact on professional development and that it means a lot. So I, I look at this um, twofold that I, I kind of offer what I think is the a, a deep a path forward that might get us to where we need to be so there is an element of quantitative data right so that's the that's the numeric values you could assign one through four and do an average and what have you so 
there is the ability to do a qualitative assessment, a quantitative assessment of it. And then there's the qualitative, which is going to come in into comments, into evidence, into, as Glenn said, even a persuasive case in somebody's evaluation might weigh higher. So I think the committee as a whole needs to understand that there are multiple elements that go into an overall evaluation. What I would suggest would be that in advance of our meeting, and Glenn goes through the the rubric in those pieces that we provide him with a subsection of some of the goals that Dr. McCall has with the actual standards. So then they are relatable to what we're going to see on one of the standards. And people can visualize that and start to formulate a, a discussion. It's not to give Dr. McCall an evaluation at that point of that, but they can start to think of these are the qualitative pieces that you might take into account. Here's the examples of potential evidence, right? So now people leave that meeting and they know that there's a quantitative piece and a qualitative piece of that. And hopefully people are looking at it that their input helps the collective whole come to that composite or that aggregate evaluation. That's, I, I just I think you're going to look at stuff different than I'm going to look at it. Mike's going to look at it different. Eric's going to look at it. Someone else is going to look at it with a different set of eyes. But having that qualitative piece together, hopefully the quantitative isn't too far off and the qualitative all leads together. I don't know the other way to do that outside of just saying, you know, you need two out of these three, and then it seems more quantitative than qualitative. If I'm a data person, I would love to just say data is here it is, like I said, but I, I that on a on a personal level, I have these discussions with my boss all the time, like because it's like a one, two, or three on something, and it's like a very can be very subjective. The difference between a three and a two, you don't want to get a one, but you don't want to get, you know, you you want to you want the evidence to show that you have a three, and I think of it as the same way, like Dr. McCall doesn't have any surprises in this process. He knows the standards, he knows the evidence, he knows the rubric. So part of this process is Dr. McCall has the ability to supply that evidence, write a narrative for that, right? So I mean, that's where I think some of it comes into play in using that professional judgment as well, that here's what the rubric says, here's how Dr. McCall is is presenting that evidence or the progress towards those goals and probably looking at it from a professional development perspective as well. And I don't want to speak for you, Dr. McCall, but I think that's the lens that that we often see in terms of that that um, evidence that you'll provide and that information in advance of the evaluation. So yeah, that's that's correct, Matt. So, I mean, that, that's the piece I don't think we talked to Glenn about much, Linda, right, is that opportunity, like, there's there's a big, there's a burden on, on Dr. McCall, and again, back to, like, professional world, I write a self-evaluation before my boss gives me an evaluation, right? And I think that that's real important, because if you're not aligned, that's something that needs to be addressed in that discussion because we're not speaking the same language. So if you have ideas, Linda, I'm open for them. If you, if you're thinking of a mathematical format, some way that we apply consistency, like I'm a hundred percent for that. I just haven't, been able to think of one outside of, you know, I was hoping Glenn would give us a little more, but he validated like these are the components and then we've got to compile that and put it together. You know, Matt, I think what might be helpful is, you know, it's almost becoming like a working session, right? 
Um, but I think what, what we're trying to get our heads around is what are the instructions beyond what we've given in the past? What are the instructions that we want to go to the full school committee? And, you know, even before you start, we start talking about what the instructions are, I think Linda has a, a, a question as to, you know, are we going to, as part of those instructions, give instructions on whether or not um, you round up, you round down, you uh, take an average, you, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Linda, but that's kind of what I'm hearing, right? Um, uh, whether, you know, we say that all evidence must be met or some evidence must be met or no evidence must be met. So the question is, are we going to give instructions in, in those areas? But overall, we're, we're, we're going we're, we're to give some kind of instruction, right? That, that's why we're talking tonight. So, you know, maybe it's worth just putting down a piece of paper for ourselves um, what we think those instructions are and see that we have some consensus on it. Does that help? A suggestion. Mm -hmm. Would you want to have that discussion now, Mike? Yeah, I think, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm not going to be the first to offer instructions, though. So I, I'll, um, we can't command people to do anything, but I think part right. of, part of any instructions would be to share the resources that we have. So to be informed before you go, um, complete an evaluation. So I think the resources Glenn shared, the specific goals and the rubric and all of that, that data is super important for people to have for a baseline. So if I was thinking of instructions, it would be to, to go through that in advance, read through the goals, read through the rubric associated with it. Think about the evidence of, of what's available and align that with where the rubric provides guidance for, for the rating and have evidence to support it, identify a rating, and identify why why you've done it and complete the evaluation appropriately. That's how I look at it for instructions. Now, how does that get condensed down to something operational? Because at the end of the day, the completed task is to complete the evaluation. So how do you best prepare somebody to be able to do all those things? Is it a drip campaign? Do we say we have a meeting Monday with Glenn? Here's um, documentation to read in advance. I don't know the answers, Mike, but it's definitely there's an exercise. No, in this is a group, I think we're trying to have a group discussion. <laughs> so you know, let's let's open it for thoughts. I mean, I I have some some thoughts around it too, but I'd be interested in hearing from others other than. You know, we raised the question as to how specific do we want to be um, around providing instructions on how to use the rubric, which is, you know, do you, so let's take the question one by one, right? I heard, Linda, you mentioned, um, do we round up or round down? Do we want to provide guidance on that? I think so. Yeah, I think that, I think that's been a, prevailing question from from this oh, club in the past, right? Is that, oh, people didn't know if they should round up or round down. And, you know, depending on your point of view, your, you know, your, your background, you're going to, you're going to think one way or the other. So what's the instruction or the guidance that we want to give? I, I mean, I'm the newbie here. <laughs> I mean, I know Eric too, but you know, here that's where that's where I um, I'm looking for consistency. So some people have talked about how we've got to meet all the criteria, and some people don't. So I don't know. I was hoping that Glenn would be able to 
to say what most in Massachusetts do. Um, but I, I didn't I didn't hear that. <laughs> so um, maybe there isn't a most. And what have you it, when aggregating in the past, what have you what have you done? When you've been taking hours, if you know at that level before you you're going down to the granular, like at, at the upper level, what do you do? So in the past, in the years past, when we've done the aggregation, we've done the the quantitative aggregation and taken an average and typically assessed where that was. And there is sentiment in the qualitative piece. So I think we've done a lot of the practices that Glenn has said in terms of reading the evaluation and supporting evidence um, in general. I think when we did that and say that it was assigning a number to each, if it's one through four and the number is 3.2, you're not going to round up to a four, right? But if it were closer to a 3.6 or 3.7, you're probably going to round up. So there, there is that ability to have kind of a defined natural set of, of, rounding principles in place. And I think that's what Glenn, he said it a couple times, having 22 gives you the ability to have a little more, one one number as a one isn't going to throw the average completely off. You don't need to throw that out with as opposed to five people. So that's what we've typically done in the past, Linda. Um, and when there's been a close call as a, as a subcommittee, we've talked as aggregators that this was here, saw a lot of comments on this, this was very persuasive, and we, we used our, our best judgment as a subcommittee to help guide the main aggregator who was um, Chair Mills in the past, and he would gain that kind of consensus and guidance on that. So I've always felt comfortable like in that process that the the will of the subcommittee got filtered up to the aggregator and then Ken was able to translate that. And again, it's the, the will of the full school committee to accept that evaluation. Yeah, I'm actually less concerned about the aggregation than, than what I thought we were talking about before were you know, what's the guidance or instructions that we're giving the individual members because different individual members have their own um, basis, uh, you know, and could be different from person to person, whether you round up or round down. Um, so, so I'm not, again, you know, when we do the aggregation, we have a committee of one, two, three, four. Um, you know, hopefully we can gain some kind of consensus in doing that. Um, uh, at, at, you know, at the time and use our judgment. Um, but the question, again, that I'm hearing, Linda, you offer is, you know, well, we ought to be able to tell um, the members how to use the rubric, and we ought to be able to tell them whether they should round up or round down. What do we want to tell them? We want to tell them to round up or round down. We just heard Glenn Kutcher tell them that we give that we typically have tell people to use their own judgment. So I'll ask you this, Mike. If you say round up, is a three point three a four? Is well, so so I guess you know. So so in the example where I have a a proficient and a exemplary, so I have a three point five, right in the middle. So that, do I, do? that I think, do I think exemplary. I guess the, the what I'm hearing is that there's some that, that that and and again I I came into this meeting thinking the same thing. Like boy, wouldn't it be great? I mean, if, if the standard was that um, when we fill out rubrics, uh, number one, um, you need to prove to us that all the evidence is there. And by the way, I didn't hear anything to the contrary. I think that he did say that. So I think to me that's one of our our um, our pieces of guidance is that we need to look for evidence to support, you know, you as an evaluator should look for evidence to support your rating. Um, two, you know, I would have loved to have heard, well, you know, if, if there are, um, 
three things, it's always the highest ping thing that was picked. It's always the lowest thing that was picked. It's always the medium, median thing that's picked. What I heard was use your judgment. Uh, yeah. It, I, I don't have a better answer. <laughs> I mean, maybe with 22 people, you arrive closer to the truth with using your own judgment than three, five, committee, you know, member committee. I don't know, but yeah, I, I and that's what I was saying before in terms of art and science, right? Like I, I was looking for a little more science to this process too, but we didn't get that. And, and so, you know, what can we do? Well, we can provide some guidance, but can we provide guidance that's specific to say, you know, um, if I, um, pick proficient and exemplary and needs, all in three subcategories. What do I pick for the, or the substandard? What do I pick for the standard? Well, you picked the lowest, that it should always be the lowest, or the highest, it should always be the highest, or you know, do take the median, it should be that. I, I don't have a good answer for that. I didn't hear a good answer for how to do that scientifically. So Sorry, do we heard. commit to uh... This year, we everybody used their best judgment, and some people will treat it as a rubric, and some people will choose it as rounding. And then next year, we have something firm from the outset of what people should be. Because it, I mean, it, it matters. It, it it matters to have that as an upfront discussion at the setting of the goals. Do you know what I mean? If we're going to count a three point five as a three, or if we're going to count it as a four. That needs to be that needs to be up front in this whole process. So if we're going to, I mean, it, I, I don't know if I'm expressing myself clearly. <laughs> I'm just trying to say that that you know we have either either we should just make a call or we have another another cycle where it you use your best judgment and we hope that it. Uh, people's ratings are reflected by the time it gets to the aggregate. So when you say use it as a rubric, tell me what you envision. When we say use this as a rubric, tell us what you envision the instructions could be, not what they should be, but what they could be if we're using this as a rubric to, to members. In order to meet proficient, all four criteria have to be met. If three out of four aren't, then it cannot be considered proficient, right? That, that's what I mean by a rubric, okay. that you have to meet all of those, not, not the best of them or most of them, but before you can move on to the next level, all of these have to be met. So that, that's helpful for me. So is that helpful for, I mean, Matt, I don't want to drive the, the conversation here, but I think that, you know, there's two different pathways, right? One is just do what we did last year with some some guidance around um, some, some guidance around trying to be supportive, looking for evidence. And then the other is, you know, let's use this as a rubric, but in order to achieve a standard, the, the lowest standard, I think is what I'm hearing you say, is 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 you know is is the one that carries for the the lowest rating for the substandard is what carries for the standard and then the lowest rating for the standard is what carries for the overall i assume is an extension of that right and so because of that impact that's where i would want to i mean we would have to have that clear from the outset and it and from it the outset mean the outset of, of the cycle that. of the very beginning of the cycle in the summer when you're talking about the goals that that organizing principle of how we would be using this tool come April would have to be set in the summer yep. before I mean otherwise it's it's it's, it's completely unfair <laughs> right it's yeah. not biting no, so what, I, what I'm hearing you say Linda is that you know, what are we, the question is, what are the instructions or guidance that we're going to give to the committee on the 12th when we start yeah. when we open the evaluation? 
And is it a rubric, which as you've defined it is, you know, you take the lower standard for each item or is it, you know, what we've done in the past, perhaps with some, some additional uh, guidance around evidence and, and subjective feedback. And then what I'm hearing you say is, well, we can't do it as a rubric because we haven't established that we're going to do it that way at the beginning of the re of this, the evaluation cycle. And by the way, I don't disagree with you, but I think that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So does that answer our question? That well, I suppose so. I mean, you know, the um, I mean, the the problem that I was seeing in the past was that some people treated it as a rubric, and so we're carrying that lower standard across all categories. And then other members were not. So I think that I believe, I don't know actually, I don't know if, if there was a strong trend one way or the other. Um, but I think that we could give guidance at this, at this set of, of uh, instructions, you know, on, on Monday um, about, you know, don't, don't use it as rubric or, you know, use it in some other way. But I think that that has been something that needs to be clarified. Or we have to um, acknowledge it in some way in the in the process when it comes time to the aggregate, which I think might be how it has been done in the past. I, I believe, without yeah, pulling out- Yeah, would be rather than calling it yeah. one thing or another, my, my suggestion would be that we echo some of the things that we've heard Glenn say tonight, which is that um, in the instances where there are um, differing ratings and we're trying to, or you as a member are trying to sum up, uh, we encourage you to weigh what you think is most important and use your professional judgment in determining what that overall should roll up to. And I think that's probably more or less what people have been doing. Just a quick question that, um, he mentioned um, weighting of the standards. Do we do we not do that? Like each one's worth equal, or one worth more, or I don't know that we've gone through a process of weighting okay. the, the, the substandards. Okay, I don't believe I we have. At least I've never heard that we have. Okay. Okay. Cool. Darryl I just, it just yeah, we haven't. Okay. The um, I just want to reiterate what Linda said too about the um. I mean, it would be totally unfair to be able to go through that level of, of detail right now. So I, I but if, 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 if that's something that Dr. McCall wanted to do in the future iteration, I think it's, it's certainly worthy of a discussion. It would tend to lead to more of a, maybe of a technical outcome that, that we're trying to achieve. Um, one question I did have for Dr. McCall is when you get this report, what, what how do you interpret it? Right? Do you look at, I have this score, or do you, what does that feel like to you? And, and what do you do with the other information that's contained in the report beyond the numbers, I guess? So great question, Eric. Um, I, I read through all the individual comments because I find that um, some are more detailed um, and actually are you know, helpful to me. Uh, others are just a little more like, you know, I think Linda might have said this or somebody else, just they're very bland, generic, um, don't really do much. Uh, the, the specific information is helpful. Um, what, what's, what, and here's why I'm saying we should do this earlier rather than later is this happens now. Um, you know, we're able to then roll into a new evaluation process that hopefully we can tie some of this stuff together in terms of looking at this and what can I what can I glean from the information shared here, roll it into uh, a new form of an evaluation in terms of a goal or goals so that I can better myself. Because ultimately that's the, the purpose. The purpose of this in same, you know, the same way I do with all of the people that I evaluate, it's it's not for me to do a gotcha. It's for me to say, okay, hey, did a great job on this. I'd really like to, you know, I'd really like you to try working on A, B, and C next year as we move forward. Then their goal might tie back to that. So that's really what I'm looking for here. Ultimately, a lot of times it's just it's one year at a time. It's one year at a time. It's there. There's very little overlap. There's very little continuity. 
Um, and I think that would be really helpful for me. You know, I, I think this is my seventh year. So having something that gives me some <clears throat> capacity to look at it over a couple of years is, is very helpful. Yeah, I didn't mean to distract from the purpose of what we're trying to do and define the um, the plan for this year, but uh, I just was curious to know how it's interpreted by Dr. McCall. And I think the the looking at the standards and weighting them will help can help solve this long term, and I think it brings into um, some of those concerns. So if you had four standards and say one were weighted very heavily, uh, it, you might have a few more of those really um, weighting metrics, Linda, like anything, the lowest subgrade in this is going to be carried over because this this standard is weighed so heavily and it's, it's part of part of the strategic initiative for the year and Dr. McCall has an influence on it. So I think we have to get to that place as a, as a committee. I think one of the things that uh, I'll kind of take this from Glenn is that they've left it very, there are reasons why things exist. Like he highlighted the red school improvement plan. So in hearing that my feeling would be, Dr. McCall would leave a meeting like this and make sure that the school improvement plans are part of the evaluation process because he knows that that's a big ask for the Association of School Committees, right? So there's going to be evidence that I think inherently just becomes part of the routine, but there should be other evidence depending on the weighting of of those standards. And right now to say, hey, provide more evidence for this standard versus the other in a, a week's notice is probably not the best way to do it. But I think going forward, this is something that makes a lot of sense. Yep. Yeah. So, so, so does that leave us where we have a list of improvements, I think, that assuming whoever is part of this come next time that we can start talking about it as early as possible. But, but, but our guidance now seems to be just defaulting to, we're going to kind of do what we've done in the past mostly, right? And just provide additional, well, I don't even know if it's additional, if we've provided these guides that Glenn referenced today and we've just, uh, you know, as an, as an additional reference point, and say, consider this when you're filling it out. I mean, that kind of sounds where it is, but uh, is that right? Yeah, and I think I think one of the things that might make sense is, I think there's a stress for evidence, right? As the evalu individual evaluator, that having evidence to support how you are using your professional judgment on the rubric can help guide what the rating might be so if you're in a situation where you're using numeric data and deciding whether to round up or round down and you're in the middle evidence should be that determining factor and if you don't have the evidence then i think it it goes to professional judgment that you know what it's in the middle i don't have the professional evidence so i'm probably going to use my professional opinion to look at it from this perspective versus that so to me that's the number one thing that we can stress is that evidence and support that in your comments because as that gets rolled up to the aggregator that's super impactful for the person who's receiving this evaluation to be able to take this as part of professional development as impact to the district but it's also super important as the aggregator looks at 22 individual evaluations and determines kind of how to consolidate these into a centralized themed evaluation. And it's, it's a, a loose set. I would like to just almost distribute the tool and say, everyone go work on it for two hours and we're going to it's due in two hours. Like I always have this, like block your time off, 
everyone's going to get it, go do it for two hours and then submit it. And then we're done with the evaluation process. But that, that's kind of like a mandatory, like meeting, do it, break away. To me, that would be the best way to do it because then you're getting a focused uh, mindset to have it done as opposed to like two weeks time where some people want that time, but we could theoretically just have it knocked out and give people two hours to do it. So, so Matt, um, just on the topic of get, giving instructions for the full committee, um, uh, I, I honestly, I don't recall from last year, but um, do, do we usually give, um, give a reminder of like, this takes time, you're going to need to block out a good amount of a good amount of time to fill this out to give it the focus that it deserves and um, is required. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that would just be uh, something to to remind to remind the full committee if that's not already automatic. Yeah, maybe there's maybe there's best practices that we work with Barry to put right on the form and resources available for them, right? So whoever is doing it sees that right away that here's the amount of time that you should take. So if you do want to do it in blocks, you you kind of, you can figure that out in your mind what it's going to take. I don't know. I don't have all the answers for that, Linda. You know, I know that in the past, um, Rebecca has done a really good job as of keeping me abreast as chair, like not telling me who's completed it, but it's been a week and 14 members have completed it. I'm going to be on the other eight members. And she would, in her, her own cadence, kind of continuously remind those other eight individuals. So, to me, that's been a good mechanism for at least keeping me up to date with like who's been who's done it. But again, how much time and effort and did everybody follow the same process? Probably not. Right. And I mean, I think that that's a certain amount of the nature of the beast, right, that we are individuals coming to this role. Um, yeah, I think that just the. Um, the, you know, just remind us that it does take more time than other other tasks that the committee is asked to do, um, or tasks you know required to do. So, um, you know, I think isn't like half of our committee new this year. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty sizable amount too. So. Um, that's really what I was looking for is just those kinds of reminders of this is something that the committee does every year, but it's new for a lot of people. Um, and so here are things, you, you know, almost kind of thinking back to when, when, um, when you've been new on the committee, things you would have liked to be told up front, that kind of aspect of it, I think would be um, helpful. So, I mean, that's where I was coming from with the whole, dare I say it again, the rubric thing again, and the, um, it, and just with the, the amount of time that it takes, you know, it's one of, one of the most key tasks that the committee is asked to do, I think, so to make sure that that's, um, if it's so if it's okay with the members of the subcommittee, what I can do is, um, I mean, Mike, you're, we're going to have Glenn at our next meeting. I'm happy to just put together just uh, a list, for lack of a better term, of like best practices slash guidance. And I could, I could filter that through to Mike as part of the discussion point with Glenn. And if there's no objection here, I mean, I, I don't want to mandate what people would have to do, but for resources or you know, here's some best practices when it comes to evidence, when it comes to looking at the rubric, um, resources available. I'm happy to put that together and just have it in 
some sort of written outline that somebody could reference if they needed to as a follow-up prior to doing the electronic evaluation tool, unless we just want to make sure that it's part of the discussion points at the meeting on Monday. Uh, from from my point of view, that seems okay. So, um, I, I, you know, I'm fine with that too. Um, what we don't want to do on Monday is invent the process. We want to communicate the process. Okay. Um, so, you know, if if we're going to say, "All right, Matt, go ahead and send out the instructions," then I think. The implicit assumption is you've heard us tonight. You're going to put down basically what what, what, we, what we've been talking about, and you know, if, in my note taking, it was we were going to share the MASC documents in advance. Um, we might touch upon a couple of things. Um, we will uh, put again think about the evidence um, that's needed. You know, we need to see evidence of something in order for it to have happened. Um, that we're looking to have comments support the rating, tell us why we were rating as much as you know you're, you're able to, um, and to block out time. Um, this is one of the most important uh, key. There's one of the key functions of, of school committee. Um, it's not something that that's typically done um, in a half hour and even an hour. Um, so it's, it's it's something that does require going through the evidence, looking back to the tool. Um, perhaps going back to the evidence and, and putting some thought um, into the into it. Um, so if everyone's okay with Matt doing that, I'm I'm certainly okay with it too. Um, the question that I have is, you know, now that we've kind of talked this through, do we still think it's helpful for to have Glenn come on to the full school committee, or do we feel like we've just said what we need to say and we can handle it from here and i and and for me i i can go either way i i'm leaning towards thinking that we can handle it from from our discussion here but um i can be persuaded too Sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't quite make that out. That connection, but what you said, Linda. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I said that I I would lean towards thinking that um, we could handle it for Monday. Um, yeah. But I'd be persuaded. Yeah. Thank Thank you for repeating that. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, I think that this might be one of the hardest questions of the night. Actually, uh, I don't know. That's a great question. I feel like you know he's got a lot of information. In, in experience, but maybe that's kind of dangerous in some ways, um, in the sense that we sort of defined it and worked through it ourselves enough to move this year forward, probably, in in a kind of an agreement that that with, with Linda on that one. Matt, I can see both sides of it. I. I think that we as a subcommittee have enough information to be able to guide a, a conversation with the full committee. I'm a planner by nature, so I would just ask this subcommittee, would we want to convene in advance of the, the meeting to, I don't want to say dry run, but make sure that we're going over the appropriate um, things that we want to address with the full school committee if we so decide. To, to move forward with it. And I'm not asking for a long meeting, but I'm thinking maybe a half hour, an hour, just so the four members here, we're all on the, the same page. I'm fine with that. Um, I, I'm, I'm fine with it. There is a question of logistics. I'm also fine with, with you going forward based on what we've kind of talked through and hashed out. Um, you know, the, the, the concern on logistics is that, um, 
uh, we are going to need to go into executive session on on Monday. And I was originally thinking we might have to start early. I think we're, we'll probably be okay starting at seven o'clock. Um, but we have a lot on the agenda. Um, so um, if uh, if you're thinking about doing something right before the meeting on Monday, um, you know it's uh, I, I I hope that we can be very crisp and <laughs> and and brief. Yeah, the last thing I want to do is have somebody come to a full meeting and be barked out from the meetings beforehand, right? So if everybody was okay with it, what I could do is um, put together what I mentioned and I could um, have Randy distribute it amongst the members of this subcommittee and to avoid any open meeting law or deliberation, any feedback it could be filtered through through Randy, and adjustments could be made accordingly. But um, yeah, that that would even that, that would be deliberation, man. I mean, I think that you know we either make need to make a call that we're we we we've talked what you know we talked what the instructions are, and and you're good with yeah. it, or you know you're going to put together a draft and we're going to deliberate. But we, what you're describing, we would be deliberating through email. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not suggesting that. What I'm suggesting is that if there is any objections to it, we would just have a have a meeting to go over those those concerns on it. So to op to allow us the freedom to say, hey, if if we're not in agreement with this, we're going to have a meeting to talk about it. So so my concern is even even expressing an objection. Um, so sending stuff out and having to having subject to the lack of objection can be construed as deliberation. I, I just don't, I wouldn't feel comfortable with that. So I, I'm fine if you wanted to put together a small meeting. It sounds like that's, you want you want to build consensus and that makes sense. Um, you know, go, go. You know, I, I'm, I'm fine either way. I just don't think we can distribute something subject to somebody, to, to people's feedback or lack of feedback. Okay, so I'll leave it up to this, this group here to decide, does it make sense to meet in advance? Are you okay with me just, putting this together and and we'll go forward with it at the full school committee. Um, I guess I, I guess I'm not sure what what you want um, feedback on still because it, it sounded like we um, right we've got the, the list of the documents the yeah. um, the uh, uh, you know guidance on using professional judgment um, and that, what was the other one? There's another thing that was, evidence that was to support on the, the ratings, right? The and evidence and encouragement to cut to comments to support the comments. ratings and blocking out time, not a mm -hmm. small task. But that yeah. was my. And I'm happy to it, share my. Yeah, I mean, we just wrote, you just just communicated the notes, but those were the the five bullet points that I had. If mm -hmm. that's if that's what um, if that's what you wanted to to make sure we were all on board with right before the full meeting. I, I mean, I think that I'm on board with that now. I don't foresee something changing. I don't know if, if you're seeing a potential for change, Matt, but, but that's what you're looking to address. Yeah, so um, I just wanna make sure that we're on the same page with your five bullet points, Mike, because I maybe I'm combining ones, but I have the sharing the MAC, MAC docs in advance, evidence looking for comments to support the rating and blocking out time and but, then using professional judgment was the other one that um linda mentioned and we all talked about okay so if we are going to have a meeting in advance we're going to have to get that out tomorrow um 48 hours in advance um do we want to meet in advance i think i heard linda say yes i think i heard mike say yes i'm not sure or you said no no, no. linda shaking your head no <laughs> mike is shaking his head no and we haven't heard from eric yet <laughs> well based on the discussion we just had there i'm fine without meeting yeah awesome so i'm gonna meet, i'm gonna meet by myself and put this together in advance for for monday how's that sound that's perfect that's good all right so having said that, I think we can um, move on from item number three on the agenda. Um, item number two was to approve the minutes. And um, I wanted to um, discuss this in advance because I noticed on the minutes, we didn't identify who 
nominated Linda and who um, who seconded that, and we don't have the vote for her to be elected um, vice chair. So happy to talk about making an amendment to that. I can bring this back to Randy and we can just table it for the next meeting and make the necessary adjustments. But I did notice that right off the top of the minutes. Yeah, and I, you know, I, have, I, I've, I haven't had a chance to go back to my, I always write the notes and then type them just because it's my setup. Um, I have this like memory of typing in all that information. So I just want to, if, if it's okay, I just want to look back and see, where did it go? I, I swear I typed it in. So um, if that's okay to, to push it off to the yeah. next meeting, I would, yeah. Perfect. And then the, the next item on the agenda is to discuss um, 360 feedback. I also want to hold off on that. I think Len went into a lot of that feedback tonight. We have good information, but thinking um, going forward that this is probably a pertinent conversation as we look at goals and evidence towards next year's evaluation. So with that, um, I do apologize. We have run over the um, 6.30 to 8.30. I do pride myself on being punctual. So with that, we can take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. We'll go in roll call vote for how I see you on the Brady Bunch window. So uh, Eric, you're first. Dalton, yes. Uh, Mike, you're, you're next. Does yes. And Linda, yourself? Logan, yes. And Lavoie, yes. So that concludes our meeting. I really appreciate everybody's um, participation tonight. Really good meeting. Thank you. Thank you all. See you later. Have a good night. Good night. Yep.